You're about to join Niels Kostrup Larsen on a raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Series. Welcome or welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Andrew B and I, Nils Castro Larsen, where each week we take the pulse of the global markets through the lens of a rules-based investor. If you're new to the show, I hope that today's episode will trigger your curiosity enough to check out the back catalogue and listen to the past episodes that you may have missed, like last week's conversation with Rob, where we explored topics like how to forecast future market volatility and the pros and cons of using a value-at-risk methodology. Before the conversation took a surprising twist where we found ourselves discussing reasons why you should not be a trend follower. As you can imagine, this was a difficult segment we had to go through. Also, let me warmly recommend our latest midweek episode with Rick Rule, where he shares his personal investment philosophy and some of the wildest speculations he's done in his career in a quite personal and fun conversation. There's lots to learn from his expertise in navigating the complexities of the natural resource space, and I think you might also uh, have a smile on your face as you go along. Lastly, I'm excited to invite you to enjoy the mini CTA series where Alan and I have had the privilege of speaking with some of the decision makers of the most and the uh, of most of the largest CTAs in the world. We dive deep into uh, the most pressing topics uh, and have gained some unprecedented access to these industry leaders who share some exceptional insights to the CTA world. So head over and check them out once you're done listening to Andrew and me today. Anyways, Andrew, it is great to be back with you this week. Um, how are you doing? Where in the world are you? I hear that, I, I'm guessing you're in New York, and I, I hear that it's super warm already. Uh, what's that all about? Yeah, yeah. so I, I am back in New York. First of all, thank you so much for having me back on. Um, yeah, I, I think we forgot spring this year. I, I went, I, I got on a plane for a business trip. It was below freezing here. I got back. It was in the the high eighties or low nineties, and so uh, it is. It's it's hot and unpleasant. Uh, a lot sooner than I expected it to be. Hopefully, it will moderate. Yeah, right. Well, so apparently, it's not just the markets that surprise us from time to time. Mother Nature seems to be able to do that as well. We've got some good topics as usual uh, that we are going to uh, discuss. Before we do that, let me try and summarize what's been going on in the markets. Uh, this week. Now, following the Fed-induced banking crisis that captivated the markets last month, much debate has focused on the next course of action. Clearly, the Fed's uh, sharp and relentless rise in interest rates and negligence uh, on its regulatory responsibility contributed to the demise of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. From that, an argument can be made that they should pause from any additional rate hikes to evaluate their action to date, if not for for no other reason, um, to let the banks uh, that extended the duration too soon generate some net interest income. However, an equally persuasive argument is that the inflation mentality is starting to become entrenched. Perhaps there are three big hurdles to overcome to justify raising rates at the next meeting, and all of them have flashed a green light for the Fed to continue. The unemployment report, the consumer price index, and the producer price index all portrayed an economy that is slowing down, but by no means is falling off a cliff. That should be enough to give them the room for at least another 25 basis points hike. In addition to Friday's PPI number, the first of the money center banks released quarterly earnings results. JP Morgan, Citibank, and Wells Fargo all reported better than expected earnings for the first quarter. Investors were fearful that these three would miss expectations or report balance sheet deterioration. But contrary to that concern, all three reported better than expected results. Now, that's not to say that we're out of the woods completely in that sector. We have Bank of, of America, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, TD Bank, and US Bank Cop all reporting next week with smaller regional banks coming later in the month. Also released uh, yesterday, Friday, was the University of Michigan survey. These surveys present an unbiased portrayal of consumer sentiment in real time, as opposed to the BLS reports that are massaged and seasonally adjusted to smooth changes. In reviewing the results, many were surprised that the current conditions index currently rose 
rose to 68.6 from 66 um, last month. While that's well off the high reached in 2020, given the noticeable deceleration in the economic activity, it is surprising that it didn't fall. Now, the other U of A surprise, and this one is certainly going to be noticed by the Fed, is the one-year forward expectation of inflation, which rose to 4.6 from 3.7 last month, while that's well off the 5.4 expectation uh, touched last year that consumers expect inflation to rise further despite the rate hikes uh, to date suggest that inflation concerns are starting to become ingrained. Exactly what the Fed had hoped to avoid. Anyways, I think I managed to get through that introduction in my little, um, um, how should I say, intermittent setup here in in a hotel room in Singapore, but I I think we did okay. Andrew, um, what have you been looking at the last, I don't know, few weeks since we last spoke? Anything... Mm -hmm. Other than SVB that caught your eye? Well, I think, I, I mean, to me, SVB was absolutely fascinating and also sort of terrifying at the same time. Um, because I think one of the things that's been so remarkable about this, you know, this, uh, about this tightening cycle is we didn't have to worry about the banking system, right? I mean, the, 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 the standard view was uh, what banks have become utilities. Dodd Frank worked in the US, you know, that people had kind of, you know, we, we could worry about everything else but the banking system. The plumbing was fine. The, and so we worried about crypto. You know, we worried about uh, the nickel market and the LME. We worried about, uh, you know, the Ukraine war and oil and super, and it, you know, in China and lockdowns and all these other things, which if the banking system isn't functioning, those are sideshows with it. And, you know, so, so watching, you know, there was a period in March where it looked like, oh my God, there was this exogenous factor that nobody thought about, which is, I mean, it's taken, it took a decade to kill Credit Suisse, right? I mean, it's like it, it, I mean, the question with Credit Suisse is how was it still breathing after the series of hits that it had taken across its business? But what it also showed was, was, you know, was an organization like that. It takes a long time. You've got people have relationships with the organization, bankers that they've worked with. There's a human element to it. It kind of slows everything down. Silicon Valley Bank showed a completely different side of it. As soon as Silicon Valley B Bank hit, we were moving our money from First Republic. Not that we had it at any of the funds or anywhere else, but but it was just one of these things, well, wait a second, if $42 billion can leave SVB in a matter of hours, you don't, I mean, the whole idea of a banking crisis changed overnight. And then, you know, even more bizarrely, three weeks later, it was in the past. And it was gone. <laughs> and, 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 you know, the, the, the Fed just sort of almost, and the Treasury seemed to all sort of flippantly, implicitly guarantee, you know, all unsecured deposits in the U.S. Um, it, it was just, it was the weirdest, most jarring, exhausting month. Um, so right now I'm happy it's April, I guess. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. I, I, you make some very good points. Um, and, uh, I'm not sure it's really sunk in. Um, not e I mean, not for me, and and I'm sure for many other people, that it is quite extraordinary what's happened. And all these things, like okay, we can just guarantee everything. Um, the, even that is 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 when you think about it, it's just uh, you know very extraordinary. And I, what does it really tell you? I mean, I think it tells you that we have some huge problem somewhere. Um, if if that's the kind of guarantees that are necessary in order to bring back confidence uh, in in the markets, and I've always not always, but I've said in the last couple of years that my biggest worry is actually confidence, and it's not something we've had to worry about too much, as you pointed out. Um, but now we've seen how quick things can change, and um, of course, if that confidence or lack of confidence were to hit. The policies of the central banks and the central banks themselves, which could happen, then um, yeah. What well, I mean, I think I think if we you know if we lined up macroeconomists and said, show me your macro predictions over the past five years, we wouldn't invest with any one of them, right? It's it's everybody's macro predictions. I mean, maybe one guy gets it right once or twice in a row, and then he's completely wrong. I mean, look at look at March, right? I mean, some of the huge winners of last year. You've seen articles in, in, you know, Bloomberg and the FT talking about guys who are up a hundred, you know, 200% last year who are down 40% this year. But what I find just fascinating watching it is just the certainty with which people have, you know, so we went overnight, we had this debate in the first, you know, for several months as to whether we were in a Goldilocks situation or a Cassandra situation, Goldilocks being the economy slows down, inflation pulls back and the Fed refills the punch bowl in the second half of the year. And woohoo, let's go buy tech stocks again. Right. That was sort of one view. And the other view was, well, actually, 
the economy is so strong and so vibrant that the Fed's going to have to tap it down a little bit harder. But but in neither one of those scenarios, which was you know this was the debate that was wrenching the two year Treasury back and back and forth over over the course of months. In nowhere in that debate was what if the banking system fails and what if we go into a deep recession and you know and we're, and. So you get to the end of March, bonds are up 3% and equities are up 3% at the end of the month after having just stumbled out of a car, you know, a multi-car wreck that, that happened. It's just, it's, it, it does feel as your, your, your point about it feels like it sort of hasn't sunk in yet. It's almost like it's, it's, there's almost disbelief about what happened. Um, so we'll, so we'll see. I mean, I think, and I think the irony is that like, you know, I asked people today, uh, but, you know, and we'll talk about kind of managed teachers' performance when they say they're frustrated with managed teachers' performance. I said, like, imagine if the space was flat, you know, and and was flat in March. You'd be loading up on it because you'd be looking at it and saying, hey, sure, given how wrong people's predictions have been by such a wide margin, and, you know, where do you think equities are going to be in the next six months? They could be up 30%. They could be down 40%. Like, we have those kinds of really, really wide ranges of outcomes that are possible on both sides of it. And yet people are just utterly confident that we're going to hit down the middle of the road. And I just, and I think that's just been the fascinating part of this market that's been fueling volatility. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. Just one more comment about uh, this, this banking situation. What I also find surprising is that um, I thought we were doing stress tests on a regular basis for the banks. And if if the banks are now failing based on what the Fed is doing, I mean, that shouldn't come as a surprise to the Fed because they're do, doing it. So I'm kind of thinking, why? what's the purpose of all these things? And, and, and how can you come up with so many bad policies and not really notice that they're, you know, breaking their parts in the system that's breaking? Anyways, we'll leave uh, the banking system as it is and we'll uh, talk about something we probably know a little bit more about anyways, which is, happens to be. Managed futures trend following. So, just as a quick uh, update uh, for people, as I normally do, I mean, I think this week generally pretty good for trend followers. We have higher yields, we have higher stock prices. I think that probably suited most trend followers. Um, and in particular, there were some uh, pretty nice contributions from the Japanese stocks market, market like Nikkei and Topics. CAC 40, I think, also did pretty well in the euro stocks. Um, of course, we have one more financial sector, which is the currencies. I don't think that that necessarily contributed a lot this week. Um, and, you know, some currencies did okay, euro, yen, maybe Mexican peso. But there are other currencies like the resource uh, currencies like Australian dollar, Canadian dollar, probably not contributing positively this week. And then we had uh, high energy prices, of course, probably a small drag on performance this week, uh, since I would suspect most trend followers have a short exposure. Um, and then the softs and the meats uh, probably did uh, okay. And then we have finally um, the grains and the metals, in particular markets like corn, wheat and aluminum, where there probably were some losses this week. Otherwise, solid week for the industry. My trend barometer finished at 36, still not showing any great consistency for trend followers. Um, but uh, on the other hand, if you're not losing too much money while it's low, that's probably a good sign. Uh, numbers beat up 50, up 1.2 for the month, down 2.6 for the year. SockGen CTA index up 1.48 for the month, down 8.28 for the year. SockGen trend up 1.88, down 5.57 for the year. SockGen uh, short term traders index up 28 bips uh, for the month, uh, down 1.83 percent for the year so not much drama really uh, equity is doing well for the month uh, up a bit msci and uh, s p and and up pretty well about eight nine percent for the year while the bonds are losing a little bit of money this month All right, that was that. Um, Andrew, we are going to have to talk about some of these um, great topics um, that you brought along. I found a couple that I thought was could be interesting. Now, you told me before we pressed record that uh, you had not had time to listen to much of the CTA series, uh, and that's fine. But you also told me that people. <laughs> you also told me that people had talked to you about it. Um, so you. So yeah. so I'm curious what they're telling mm -hmm. you because of course I was kind of hoping you would listen because I've been very diligent in trying to ask all of these big managers about replication. Uh, you know to help you get feedback on what managers think about what you guys are doing. Um, so you got some catching up to do, my friend. Um, but what I did, do indeed. Yeah. <laughs> I do indeed. Well, what did people tell you uh, so far? 
Well, I, like, I, I think everybody's concerned about replication, including not, not, you know, not just funds that are doing this, but also investors is, you know, are, are, are we too concentrated? Are, do we, do we, do we lack sufficient diversification and, and are we too slow? Right. I mean, those are, those are, those are the issues that we worry about, right? It's not, I mean, we're not, we're not fools. We, <laughs> you know, we know that we are trying to do something that is generally very, very complicated in, you know, we, we have chosen this way to do it because we think we, we decided back in 2015, it was the most simple and efficient way to get exposure to the space. But, but by no means do we think it's perfect. You know, we don't have position level reports. We're not trying to, uh, you know, drill down to the level of, um, uh, you know, of the 47th most, most important position. Um, and, uh, and, and, and those are very legitimate concerns. And our job is to look at them rigorously. Um, you know, we, Obviously, myself, I fell in love with this as a way of doing it back in 2015, so I'm never going to be fully biased in it. Um, if somebody came along and came up with a, you know, magical way of doing this, it's better than ours. It would be a very sad day for us. But but it was it would be honestly, we'd have to pivot our our, our business and find a way to adopt it. And there are have been numerous periods over the past seven years, um, or seven plus years that we've been doing it, where we've said, you know, is here's a new tool. You know, do we think it works? Do we think it enhances? Like the whole um, using trend following models. You know, one of uh, a guy that I think very highly of, Corey Hofstein, has launched an ETF in the U.S. that seems to combine a factor based replication with his own essentially trend following signals, and then kind of merge those in some fashion. We've looked at doing that in the past, and we've never done it for 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 a variety of reasons. So, um, so the the concerns are very legitimate, and and you know, and our job then is to try to give a candid response as to whether we think, you know, how concerning those those should be for investors. Yeah, no, no, that that that's fair enough. But anyways, maybe next time, since I know you're going on a on a couple of cross Atlantic trips, maybe you'll you'll have time to listen in and uh, and then I can drill a little bit deeper uh into this topic with you. Anyways, you brought along uh some topics that I also think was very relevant. Obviously we are uh at least to begin with going to stick to the topic of replication. And you said there are kind of a few things that people focus on at the moment. Uh there's a focus on drawdown in terms of what uh you've experienced in DBMF uh, compared to the drawdown uh that the CTA in Sockgen CTA index has experienced. Why don't you talk about that a bit, and then we'll dive into some. I I may have some comments to each of the points, so um, but I'd love to hear what uh, kind of the points you you raised. Yeah, so 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 our drawdown since the peak last fall is larger than I would have expected, right? I mean, let's. So when you know we've been doing this uh, since the end of 2015 in Europe, and then middle of 2016 we started doing it in the U.S. and that's that's the basis of the strategies that we that that we run uh, in an ETF in the U.S. From the peak, historically, what we've seen is that replication on the way down has roughly matched or even done sl- has a slightly lower drawdown than the index as a whole. And and within the index, there's always you know wide dispersion. Some guys are going down a lot. Some guys are cutting their risk earlier. There's all these kind of variations in it. Um, when you go all the way back to the early 2000s, if you were if we had been running the same the same models and same strategies back then, you actually do see periods where replication does worse. Than, than, than the index. I don't know, candidly, what was going on back then. The farther back we go in hedge fund land, the more opaque um, um, it all becomes. But, but from our life experience, if you told me last fall that the index would have had a 10% drawdown, my guess is we would have been down 12 to 13. And, 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 and this, you know, the simple driver is that if hedge funds go up 10, they report up 8. They drop 10, they report down 8. Right. So, so if they have an eight vol roughly over time, we're going to have a 10 vol because we're aiming for pre-fee returns and we don't charge incentive fees. So you're naturally going to have that. So from the peak last fall and, you know, what, given that the, everyone gave up gains in the last few months of last year, I would expect to expect to give back more on it. Uh, and then in January and February, I think, you know, the, the concentration of our portfolio clearly hurt us. We had performed in both January and February. And I think our, our best explanation really is that, you know, under the, the long history of hedge funds is that the deepest and most liquid positions tend to be safer during really bad market conditions. Because, you know, if you're a bond investor and you've got a, you know, highly liquid bond and you've got some marginal bond that you own X percentage of the, of the issue on, if things go south, you tend to lose 30% on the little bond. 
if you're losing 8% on the big bond, right? It's kind of this, this, this liquidity asymmetry of the markets. But I think what happened in January is that, is that, you know, our concentration plus some timing issues in terms of how we rebalance, it costs us maybe 500 basis points, which is, which is significant on a two month basis, but really not that significant over time when you just look at kind of the variability of, of returns. And then we get into March and then March was the second worst month for the CTA index since 2000. And we matched it perfectly on the way down. I mean, it's, which, I, you know, I, I would love to have, you know, have missed on the replication side and, and not go down as much, but, but, you know, we were both down roughly 7%. So it's been a weird sort of combination of three things in a row. But that being said, it's something that we have to address with people because now when you look at our numbers over time, you'll see a drawdown that exceeds that of the index slightly more than I would have expected. And to try to make an assessment as to whether those things that happened are likely to persist. And the only one that I would say that is, you know, we'd have to really focus on is January and February and underperformance. Are those two months representative of a broad change in the markets that I think you and I even talked about in, in, in the last webinar, or are they isolated events where we think things will go back to more normal market conditions? But just remind me, uh, I mean, so many things happen. What was so unusual, you said, in, in January and February from your point of view? I don't remember them as being so unusual, really, just a bit of volatility. So what I think what I think happened, so if, if we had, for instance, not just been invested in the treasuries, but had also had, you know, been invested in British, German, and Japanese fixed income, if we were diversified across that. So, so, so here's a, you know, going back to the diversification argument, the, the crazy thing about the first three months of the year is it was a one-factor market. Okay. The, the very best replication of the SockGen CTA index of the first three months of the year was one factor. It was just do the two-year treasury and nothing else. And, and you would have had a correlation of 0.92 and within 100 basis points of, of net performance with, I mean, really, really high, high tracking over time. And so from what I think happened with us when we look at it is, you know, if, we, if we'd had, for instance, the Mexican peso, that would have helped us. If we'd had, um, uh, I think, you know, Canadian fixed income, I think that would have helped us. So, so, you know, when we look at a period like this, we always try to find what we wished we'd known about on December 31 and then held through that two month period. And so as we look at it and you can never get a perfectly crystal clear picture as to the differences, cause we can't see obviously the exact positioning and weighting of everybody in the portfolios and what's driving their numbers. But, um, but, but if you, if you, you know, the general construct is we take about 10% of the positions of the space and try to match pre few returns. And that works really well about 90% of the time. And so on average, because we're cutting out lots of fees and expenses, we've on average, we expected to do three to 400 basis points better than the overall space purely through fee efficiency. And, and so if you look at it on a rolling one year basis, we tend to outperform about 90% of the time which is a sort of astonishing thing when you're talking about an, an, an ETF versus hedge funds with minimums, you know, monthly liquidity, et cetera. Um, the, but 10% of the time we will underperform and the question is why. And so if you look at not from the peak, but over a rolling one year period, we're actually pretty much in line with the SOC Gen CTA index in part because we did so much better in the first nine months of last year, in part because of that 20% fee, because we were that, you know, was a huge boost to our performance. And then we've given that back plus a little bit more since then. So we, I don't know. I mean, you, you may know better as to, as, as to how, how it was impacting your portfolio, but, but we, we clearly missed something. Yeah. So, so, I mean, you bring up a couple of uh, interesting points and I think you and I have kind of discussed uh, some of these uh, in the past. So, uh, so, so first of all, I, I, I have to just mention that it sounds like performance fee can be a good thing because they also come back when they're not crystallized. So, uh, so <laughs> well, it's true. Except this year, except this year, one, you know, if I were an investor who'd paid a lot of incentive fees last year, I might be asking for a rebate this year, but that's a, that's a, that's a different conversation if I'm a long-term investor. Well, it's very, very early, early days, yeah. right? But, but, but there's a couple of interesting things, um, and I'm going to try and, and see if I can and remember them. So you talk about the influence, say, that the two-year note had uh, in that period as a, as a quote-unquote factor. And if I look, and I think... I think we talked about this before that that in a period of time that we saw maybe the last 18 months or 
even more, almost two years prior to 2023, trend following returns were reasonably orderly and they came predominantly from fixed income. And you trade a lot of fixed income. So I would imagine it was relatively easy to capture that, so to speak. But I've, al I've always wondered, um, and, and I guess you could say that in the very long run, in the last two decades, probably, um, and I think that's certainly something we've always been um, reminded of, let's put it that uh, in a gentle way, um, by some people that, oh, but trend followers, they've had it so easy, all their returns came from fixed income. And that's true because that's where the most steady trends were. However, that doesn't say anything about the future, right? So I'm, I'm still of the opinion that um, if market conditions and and performance drivers in, in our world changes dramatically from the last 20 years, meaning not fixed income, then I do think, I mean, I, I mean you can certainly tell me uh, why I'm wrong if, if, if I am, but I do think it's going to be harder for, for strategies like yours, given the fact that at this point in time, you rely a lot on fixed income for the replication um, because there will, there will be periods where it's driven by commodities. It may not have been shown in, 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 in for many years, but we will, they will come at some point. Uh, equities, you may be able to capture that. Currencies, you may be able to capture, I don't know. Um, but certainly, you know, so, so that's just in my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, if you have a lot of fixed income in your replicator model, the last 20 years and certainly the last couple of years, there would have been a lot of um, kind of a tailwind for, for that kind of uh, strategy, um, but that may not be the case uh, in the future. And this year, we've seen that that particular sector can be difficult, which, of course, it will be, and it should be from time to time. It should be difficult. So the question is, is, is then that the thing that you need to address, meaning that, yeah, if once we get into fixed income difficult periods, um, we're going to have to do something different in order to keep up with the, the more diversified managers, if I can put it that way? Yeah, so I think, I think um, to me, I, I guess I would go one step below fixed income. So, so last year, for instance, I mean, fixed income, uh, we, uh, so we are in our standard models, we're, we're diversified across rates, currencies, equities, and commodities. We just have a, we only have 10 instruments, right? So we're, it's a very limited pool. So it's three treasury futures contracts, you know, three equity futures contracts, two currency contracts, and, and, and two commodity contracts. Um, so last year, uh, you know, if you look at the attribution, we made money in commodity, you know, we made money by being long oil. We made money by being short the end. That's actually our single biggest position gainer. And, um, and then we made money in, uh, by being short treasuries. Taking it one step deeper, again, it's all been driven by one trade, right? Those were commodities going up, his influences, people's expectations of rate X. So there, there was about a week period where right after the war started, commodities spiked and people thought it was re recessionary. And so we actually, in Europe, in the first fund that we did, we, we excluded commodities for usage reasons. And so we actually saw frustrating divergence because the model basically said commodities are going up, rates are going up, so we should short. We can't buy commodities, so let's short more treasuries. And then when they when they when they diverged, it cost us in the first quarter of last year. So, but I think I mean the underlying driver of all of this has been what's the Fed going to do in a month? And I think that's sort of the one trade market. Now I think I think what happened to me, what happened with the managed future space is starting in 2021, there were pretty serious people who were saying that inflation could come back. But the, the structure of the asset management business, the vast majority of it, model portfolios, institutional investors, et cetera, they are built to move slowly. You know, you're talking about people who have 10 year, 20 year capital markets assumptions, and they're totally confident in terms of how, you know, European stocks are going to do relative to the S and P 500 over the next 10 years, but they can't tell you, they have no belief that they can tell you what's going to happen in a month or two query, whether if you went back and looked at their predictions 10 years ago they're as accurate as they think they are, but it's their business, right? Their job is to, they're, they're, they're supposed to be the steady hand at the wheel. And the investment world has been trained that, you know, don't be flighty, don't sell at the bottom, don't do all these things. So the whole asset management has a narrative around not selling at the wrong time. By the way, managed futures does not, right? And that's something that, that I think we collectively have to address is there's not a compelling 
you know, my bond portfolio is down 20%. Don't worry, I'm going to get it back at maturity. My equities are down 20%. You know, buy more, don't, if anything, buy more at the bottom. Look at the past 70 years. Value stocks underperform by, you know, over over eight or 10 years, well, the next 70 years will be great, right? Everybody has a well-constructed narrative that has some fundamental grounding. So, but for about the first 18 months, when I talked to long-only investors, they couldn't change, right? They were, but they had low-rate bets throughout their entire portfolio. They were up to the gills on on FANG stocks, whose you could not possibly support their, those valuations in a higher rate environment. They had double A rated bonds with 10 year maturities at a one and a half percent yield, right? It was just by doing the simple stuff, you had a massive low rate bet. And so for about 18 months, you had a handful of macro hedge funds who were flexible and said the world has changed. And you had managed futures funds who were basically contrarian. Right. And that's sort of what, and that and people's expectations could never go, okay, maybe, okay, I'll give up that, that, that there are going to be no rate hikes in 2022. You know, uh, maybe there'll be two, you know, and then once you're at two, maybe there'll be three or four. It was this, it was people were fighting it because the fear was I go back to my clients and say, Hey, I was totally wrong at the end of 2020 when I told you that rates would be low for the next decade. And we had to find a way to make money in the context of it. Um, and so the problem is by last fall, it was, it was, it had become a consensus trade. And, you know, on November 13th last year, I was in Boston with long only investors. And this was the day that the print came in and the yen took off and everything was kind of reversing and we're watching it. You know, it's like, it's like we're stumbling into propellers and left and right in, 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 in our portfolios. And I'm seeing the long only guys across the table and they're just as, as, as upset as we are, but they're making money, right? Cause their equities just, just want to accept they're watching their benchmarks fly away. Because they're underweight tech stocks, they're underweight. Um, they've 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 cut the duration on their bond portfolio. They've so I think what's you know the struggle over the past six months has been that a lot of the consensus trade really bought into the inflation trade. So we've in a sense all collectively been in a crowded trade, which is which is why this you've had this laser like focus on what the Fed does next and what the next inflation print does, which which is not really helpful from an investment perspective, from a long-term investment perspective, but it's what's driving this kind of insane schizoid market. Yeah, no, absolutely. The other thing, so last week I had Rich on and we were, uh, no, the week before I had Rich on and we were talking about, uh, we were talking about DBMF because of these um, articles that had come out and whether it was decoupling a bit from the benchmark or not. And I, I think we concluded that it probably wasn't. But what we found was, interestingly enough, and I don't, I'm sure you've done the chart, uh, Richard prepared a chart just for, for you, for he and I to, to look at. And in the period since inception, there are already two other periods where the two NAVs meet. So it's kind of like DBMF outperforming for a period of time, and then it underperforms and they meet. And then outperforms, and then they meet, and it, now it's they're meeting kind of again for the third time. And so I don't know. I mean, whether that's actually probably in a sense what you should end up expecting to some degree. And of course, then you can make the argument saying, yeah, there's going to be periods of time where we're outperforming, right? But in the but there's also going to be periods of time where someone could raise their hand and say, well, it's exactly the same. So, so, so let me, to, to take a step back, right, this is also so expectations. If we said for the next 20 years, you know, we're going to go through periods of up or down, but we're going to match the performance of the Sock Gen CTA index, uh, net of fees with comparable volatility, right? But, and, you know, with a high correlation, right? I think our correlation is close to 90% to, to, to the index. And, but it's in an ETF with daily liquidity and you can put it in, I mean, like it's that, that would be a staggering victory, right? But the reality is, and, and one of the issues with DBMF is we started actually doing the strategy in July, 2016, but because of regulatory rules, when you start an ETF, even if you were doing exactly the same thing beforehand, it's like you started from day one. So when institutional investors look at us going back, they say, well, show me at least since July, 2016, and you can look at that period. Even with the recent drawdowns, um, uh, you know, I mean, in general, we've been kind of beating this idea of outperforming by 300 basis points or more. Back when people first started doing replication in, in pre like 2006, 2007, when I first got interested in the space, 
it, it would have been, it was the holy grail, right? If you can just do what hedge funds are doing, but offer liquidity, low fees, transparency, and these other things to make it a more client-friendly vehicle, that was considered the holy grail of hedge fund investing. And people have tried a lot of different ways to do that. The only thing that's worked well is replication, and it only works in limited circumstances. It doesn't work. You can't, you can't do this to Millennium, right? You can't do this to Citadel. You can't do this to, you know, distressed debt managers or merger arbitrage. Um, but you can do it with equity long shorts and you can do it with managed futures. So in the 2010s, though, what happened was because the industry's overall returns were so low and that they were in many cases sitting under this high, you know, crushing burden of fees. If you're in a lower return environment and cash is earning zero and you have high fees, guess what? You're going to have, it's not surprising, you're going to have dead money in these strategies. So um, that's when people started to focus on, on, on outperformance. And what most people did is they said, you know, like if you look at like, for instance, the broader usage hedge fund world or the mutual fund usage world, they say, you know, the, the overall returns are embarrassingly low, right? So the overall returns of all hedge funds in these areas, like 2% per annum over a decade when everything else is going up. So you cannot make, and it's maybe a half or 40% of what actual hedge funds are doing. So you can't make a credible argument that this should be in any portfolio anywhere from an asset allocation perspective. But if you find, find the one guy who was up 10% three years in a row, or the one guy who was consistently doing 500 basis points better, you'd make an argument that that guy should fill your asset allocation bucket. And as an allocator, that's insane, right? That's, the, that's basically saying, I want exposure to hedge funds, but I'm going to pick Fred's hedge fund because he's been doing well. But, but it's what allocators had to do because they were under pressure to inc include these things in their portfolios. But what it meant was that they would give money to guys at the top at the, the peak performance, they would underperform. And so if you look at the broader liquid alts, alts world, that 2% that you would have made is certainly not impressive, but based upon how money flowed, they actually made less than zero by investing in this space, by chasing hot dots. So, so you're right. I mean, we may find ourselves, if it turns out that the world has changed and we lose some of what's been a, a pure fee and structural advantage over the past seven years. And, and just to put it in context, like from back from when we started, we still roughly doubled the performance of the SOC 10 CTA index since we started with a little bit more volatility. And that's all fees and, and efficiency. And I think, I think the interesting question that it raises is that in other parts of the asset management industry, you have more of a fragmentation of products. So we can, you know, you can get direct exposure to the S&P 500, but then you add that to a concentrated bet to a guy who's doing something meaningfully different, not, not with high overlap to the S&P 500. And so I think the diversification question gets into a really interesting argument or really interesting discussion as to whether funds in this space should be un unbundled in some fashion. And I've got to go through sort of the mental model as to how people think about that. So when you say they should be unbundled, I'm not in, entirely sure I, I know what you mean by that. So, let, okay, so let's say we conclude that, that, that I mean, let's say a reasonable per person looks at replication with 10 positions and says, you know, let's say, and we think that the broader managed future space on average, just to pick a number, does 100 positions. That, that's a little bit high, but just use, use it as a simple number. So what percentage of the returns do we think will be picked up by those 10 positions over the next 10 years? 50%? 70%? Right? It's got to, it's not, it's not 20%. Right. It's, it may not be a hundred percent. It may be, but let's, let's say it's just argument says, let's say it's 50%. So I have the ability to, and then I, and then I see managers over here and I say, well, look, I fully agree with you that positions 11 through a hundred are really valuable. And they're in fact more valuable on a sharp ratio basis or something than positions one through 10. But what would happen in a normal asset management world would be, I would then offer two products, right? I would offer a lower cost one through 10 product, which is what we're trying to do, as opposed to a really a higher sharp ratio more like in, in a sense, it's almost what man has done. I mean, with evolution, right? In that you've got, you can get those guys on the call and they can tell you more specifically what they do. But, but, but the argument, and when I've looked at the numbers, the numbers are incredible, right? And they basically made the argument that we can find 290 other markets that even with higher fees, even with capacity constraints and all sorts of other things, we can generate much, much, much higher sharp ratios because we are willing to, to, you know, to find these really esoteric markets and, 
at not insignificant cost, build the trading infrastructure to be able to access those markets and deliver that back to clients. But if, if positions 11 through a hundred, you know, think about the difference. Let's say there's a 400 basis point cost differential with implementation costs and everything else between the top half of your portfolio, and the bottom half of your portfolio, the bottom half of your portfolio has to do much, 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 much better to carry the top half. If you, if you can get that efficiently. Yeah, no. So I, that, I mean, that, yeah, I mean, there's, 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 I'll just, so there's an analog in, in, in the equity long short world and in other hedge fund areas where, you know, people say, well, these are my, my 10 favorite positions, but I've got another 30 stocks that I like. And so, you know, what allocators have wrestled with is maybe I just need the 10, but the problem is the 10, you can often copy yourself because you can see what positions they own through things like 13F filings. So, so it, it really, part of the challenge that equity long short has, has had is justifying a one and a half and 20 fee structure for the whole strategy. When somebody who has the capabilities can do it, can, can basically, you know, often copy the biggest and most important positions essentially for free. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you, you know, that I like discussing these things with you. We, we don't have to agree on everything. Uh, we agree on some things. Um, as I've said to you before, I think what you guys are doing um, is is a great service to uh, smaller investors who um, could not otherwise get exposure to the space. I think that's fantastic. I don't necessarily agree that 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 strategies like yours has to be sold as oh, but we are four hundred basis points better because I actually don't necessarily no, I agree. exactly I completely agree. Yeah, that's, because that's I think just, that's just what we did exactly yeah, yeah. because I actually think that the fact that you can do this daily liquidity and it's an ETF and and uh, and so on and so forth uh, is a great service uh, to to investors and it should be enough and of course I also am of the opinion uh, having watched these managers now for 30 years you know it is still the the, the same five or ten names that is on top of the uh, rankings and once you just zoom out a little bit they do perform pretty well and it's not that hard for investors institutional investors to pick uh, a decent group of managers so to speak and 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 i always thought it was funny that I, and i know why they do it but I, I still think it's funny that they feel they have to replicate an index i mean i think you can find five managers that will beat the index for them i mean they should be able to at least so First of all, I, I expect very, very, very little to get very little traction with institutional investors who are currently invested with hedge funds. And the reason is, is so, so first of all, I mean, our, our primary focus is, is, is providing, you know, a, an access vehicle. I think the structure of this industry, right? I find managed futures incredibly interesting, fascinating sociologically, because I think the industry grew up with a very, very loyal core group of allocators that, that they tend to be more quantitatively sophisticated. They're working at pension plans. They tend to have a lot of time to evaluate all 20 of the constituents of the SOC Gen CTA index. And, and in a sense, you know, having talked to a lot of those people, a lot of their, it's what they like to do, right? It's not, it's not about, it's, it's not their money. It's what they like to do. They've been hired to do this job. They're going to keep doing it. And so they are going to, and, and I think man actually, yeah, you know, I think if you talk to Abby, Abby will 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 say that you need lots and lots of positions, yeah, underlying managers to diversify. Alpha Simplex gets you pretty darn close to the SOC Gen CTA index over time, with maybe a little more ball. Actually, we at Alpha Simplex end up being being quite close over time. The uh, you know you can put two guys together or three guys together, and you 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 achieve much of your diversification goal. But what I think is fascinating is that the language around the industry is geared toward the guys who like the space and the marketing is geared toward it's, 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 it's been a relatively flat pool of capital for a decade. And so if you look at the U S mutual fund space, there's about 20 billion in assets today. And there was 28 billion when we started in part because AQR was 14 billion of it. Right? So here we are, you know, with something that with a strategy that has more diversification value in a portfolio than private equity, private credit, infrastructure, REITs, commodities, you name it. And it's 10 basis points of the mutual fund world in the US. And it's five basis points of the liquid alts world, which is populated by garbage products. So, so why is that? Because I think the language of the space is about talking on technical terms to the people who want to hear it. Because 
we're all selling quantitative leverage long short derivative based black boxes. Right. Ours is the most open of the black boxes because you can see our positions every day. I don't know what you'd really do with it. I don't know how you, you know, look at our positions and say, you know, well, this makes me feel really good about, you know, you our could, returns over the next replicate three days. It. <laughs> you can rally it to do it tomorrow. <laughs> so, um, so the, um, uh, actually, I, I actually love that ETF idea. It's the most is like it would be such poetic justice to have the 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 DBMF plus plus day plus one day ETF uh, at at ten basis points less. Um, but but what I think is so but but the language of the space, right? You're you're talking other than Abby and a few other players, you're really talking about single managers who are pitching the space a little bit, but mostly why they're better than everybody else because they don't have to really convince people about the space because they're already sold on it. And so in a sense, what they're saying, and I, I call it kind of this hunger games of marketing, because what they're trying to say is, you know, is I'm better than them because I'm marginally cheaper or I, um, I do better in these kinds of markets. I have more instruments. I got rid of my equity risk. I've got stop losses. I've got, and what they're really doing, I've described it as walking into a car dealership and they've just dis disassembled all the cars and they're pointing to, you know, well, look at the brake system over here versus that over there. And, and for 99% of the investors who should be using this in their portfolios, it's terrifying. It's terrifying. They don't, there's no visceral way of saying, oh, I feel really good because I think the one that's probably most compelling is when you say I have stop losses and we're going to get out before anything really bad happens. But I think that, you know, when we've looked at it and we said, it sounds like a great idea. The problem is we think it's a toy cost as to whether you get stopped out when you want to be stopped out or stopped out when you don't want to be stopped out. Um, and you, like you mentioned, it should be a good week for people. Um, when it, if rates are going up this week, I think there are plenty of guys who, who, who did get out of their fixed income positions by virtue of these other things, not good for them. But on the other hand, it was great for them in the last two weeks of March. Um, so really what, what I'm focused on is is primarily, and, and whether that means we match the performance over time, if we did 200 basis points worse over time, net of fees, but we could still deliver the vast majority of the benefits to the other 99%. But then my job is, you know, I'm, I'm the guy on your podcast who knows less about this space in a lot of ways than everybody else. And, and so I'm the guy who has to kind of like translate what this means for an investor and how they live with it as an allocation for the next 10 years. I think the reason why I point to this point and I um, I so enjoy and, and appreciate that we can have this conversation um, and, and that is just, as you pointed out, it's about setting expectations, right? And I think I think there is a danger and disappointment if you go out and you say, well, we're going to do this plus 500 or 400 basis points because I, 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 I think that's going to be a hard thing to do over 10, 15, 20 years. But you know, we'll we'll have this discussion in in two thousand and 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 thirty eight, and and then we'll see. But I'd like to say so. So first of all, dogmatists, right? We're not. You know, I'm, I'm not Kathy Wood telling you that. You know, in the face of of, of evidence, I'm not going to change my mind on things. We are totally open to the idea that we may need more factors over time. This is very weird for a quantitative firm is that I hope you and I are having this conversation in 10 years and you open it up and say, you know, tell me all the changes you've made in your model over the past 10 years. And we say zero, right? In time and, and, but during that 10 year period of time, every month and every quarter, we will be having heated internal debates as to whether is this is the time, you know, we've seen four years of evidence that the Mexican pesos would make, make, you know, everybody loves the Mexican peso or you know, crypto has come back from the grave and people are using it meaningfully in their portfolio. So, so we could find ourselves with a 15, 16, 17, 18 factor set, but it's a very, very high hurdle for us to do it because what we've also seen is that, you know, the more you change stuff, like, like one of our collective competitors out there really changed what they did around 2015. They were trend, 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 and then they became machine learning, machine learning, machine learning, machine learning. And just looking at their numbers, what it looks like is the machines learn to be anti-trend, right? But, but if they present a 30 year track record, it's like saying I was a value investor for, for 25 years and I've been a, and I've been a growth investor for five years. That's kind of a big deal, um, uh, in terms of a, a change in the underlying strategy. There's a risk, you know, that's what we mean by, 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 you know, the unexpected, that's why they can go down 20% 
in in March of 20. In 20, when other people aren't because they're catching falling knives when everybody else is, you know, kind of pivoting out of things. And not everybody else, probably, but, but, but most people. And so I think the challenge, talk about the five guys who've been around doing this, just, just again, to put it in context, when we started in 2015, 2016, there are 49 mutual funds and ETFs in the U.S. There are 19 today. Right? This business is really good at shooting the wounded. So the ones that you see today, five of the six guys you see today have outperformed the, the SOC Gen CTA index. But I don't know anybody on earth who knew six or seven years ago that those guys would. Because in fact, what they had bet was that AQR would outperform everybody else. Alpha Simplex has, they were the second largest. Alpha Simplex has done better than the index. AQR did worse for a period of time. It's come roaring back and incredible firm. It's not, it's just, but, but, you know, last year there was one fund that was down 35%. Um, you know, you have, so there is, but you know, GSA went through a very, very bad period and then they dropped out of the business. So, so there is this, there is always this survivorship bias that, and the reason it's important is not, is, is that the guys who are looking at this space, they don't hear from the guys who aren't around anymore. You know, they open the book on this space, they do a screen and it makes it look easy because the biggest guys today are the guys who happen to have outperformed with the exception of AQR. Why we focus on all these issues is, is we're trying to, if, if people, if we're trying to give people who are looking at the space the first time a whole playbook as to the issues that they should address. It's not clear that, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I go to meetings right now where there's a platform wealth managers on the platform where man AHL is one of one of the, the American beacon fund with man HLs on it, as is the Abbey capital fund. And I say there are Pimco's on it as well. And there are incredibly good reasons to invest with those guys. If I was an advisor invested in the Dan Iveson Pimco fund for the past 10 years, I am a hero for my clients for having that allocation. And if Pimco comes to me and says, they've got something that can help in a high, in, in, in a truly inflationary environment. Of course I'm buying it. Of course I am. If I have a client who has, you know, who has a lot of centimillionaires who are invested in the man AHL diversified flagship fund and, and I want to, you know, get exposure to the same space, of course I'm going to use their fund. And, and I've probably known about these guys for 20 years. So there, there, there are tremendously good reasons to pick single managers. If I want diversified exposure to the space and I'm used to, and I, you know, I know Abbey Capital, of course I'm going to pick Abbey Capital for it. But, but there are, but what we're trying to do is identify not the people to take, not to take money from those guys, because I don't, I wouldn't move money if I was in, in those shoes, but rather to identify, you know, we're talking about a, 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 a maybe a trillion dollar pool of assets that has $4 billion invested in the space. Really a drop in the bucket. Absolutely. And I, I very much agree with your point about, uh, you know, uh, changing models and all of those things. That's definitely one of the things that uh, investors should be uh, very curious about and ask a detailed question about because, of course, a track record is made up uh, of different uh, iterations uh, of the model. And it's uh, actually one of those things that I spend most of my time talking about uh, on, on our side. So I completely agree with that. little bit about an hour or so uh, in terms of your topics Andrew bring up one other topic uh, before we we wrap up uh, is there anything else you wanted to uh, that you sent over you wanted me to bring up um, I think we've covered I, I, I love that we'll leave it in your hands yeah I, yeah I think I've, we've uh... covered most of it I, I sent this article to you because it, it it showed up in my some kind of social media feed earlier today a, a, a newspaper article that came out probably in the last 24 hours or so in the English newspaper called The Guardian. And the heading is Top 10 Hedge Funds Made 1.5 Billion in Profit from Ukraine War Food Price Spike. And then it goes on to say, analysis covering first quarter of last year raises questions over the role of speculators in inflation food prices. Now, of course, Q1 last year has been conveniently 
uh, chosen uh, as a period um, because it's it's an article written by a I think a quote unquote activist of some sort who wanted to make a point guided uh, in my opinion and surprise um, but the if I can yeah I guess I can call her that the editor <laughs> quote unquote <laughs> the editor the uh, environmental <laughs> editor who's now an expert on trend following the environmental yes, editor Fiona Harvey uh, seems to have not been questioning any of the stuff uh, she's put in her article one of those things that are, it's so wrong on so many levels if it wasn't because it's kind of late out here in Singapore, uh, I'm kind of um, tempted to to write a little. Maybe I shouldn't. Um, but basically, let me, before I comment, um, I'm going to just read a couple of, of quick quotes from the article. The article says, amongst other things, hedge farms have emerged as some of the biggest winners from the global food price spike that followed Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, with the world's 10 biggest hedge funds alone making profits estimated at nearly $2 billion. The findings compiled by Unearth, Greenpeace's investigative journalism unit, and the non-profit journalism organization Lighthouse Reports have raised fresh questions over the role of hedge funds and other speculators in inflation food prices as the global cost of labor crisis continues to bite. And then it goes on and on and on. And then it says, Olivia de Schotter, co-chair of the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems and UN Special Reporter on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights said, hedge funds and financial speculators have made obscene profits by betting on hunger and uh, exacerbating, exacerbating it. Now, I mean, the reason why it's important is that, again, this is a narrative that is coming out there. I, I don't know how many of, 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 of people in our, in our space read The Guardian, but, you know, maybe they do. Um, and, of course, it doesn't mention uh, much other than uh, about the fact that actually these prices peaked in at the end of March 2023. But here's the important point. I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. And so, so the important point is, of course, I was just quickly eyeballing some charts, right? So, and because they specifically actually mentioned the CTA... I think trend index or CTA index. So they are. So when they say the top ten hedge funds, I think they're meaning the top ten CTAs. This is why it caught my attention, and uh, I did notice that some of the our friends in the industry had declined to comment. So I'll comment for them, I guess. But um, it's, so the point is, of course, that when you look at a chart, uh, I haven't checked um, our positions, but when you look at a chart, it looks like that trend following strategies would generally have gotten long a lot of these grains way before 2022. I mean, sometime in 2021. That's where the breakout happened. Okay, so fact number one, we did not buy any of these to push up prices, and we did, in fact, not push up prices at all because prices didn't move up. Now, prices started to move up uh, before the uh, war in Ukraine, obviously, they didn't know that uh, Putin had decided to do this. Uh, and then, of course, they spiked after the invasion and moved up significantly. And there was a lot of chatter. But from a trend following point of view, and this is very important, especially if there's people out there listening today that may think, well, hang on, maybe they did push up the prices. Actually, I would say it's the opposite. First of all, those who do just static position size, as we've talked about before, they wouldn't have touched anything really um, after they got into their trade in 2021 nothing really should happen and therefore it's certainly not them and people who are doing dynamic position sizing which is the bulk of the people that they are targeting in this article actually would have done exactly the opposite as markets spike and as volatility explodes after the invasion we were selling into these rallies right so we're trying i mean we're not trying to push prices down that's not why we did it but we actually dampened the rise of these food prices uh, as March was going on uh, and prices were rallying because of the expansion of volatility. Uh, our firm did, uh, and I'm sure all of our friends in the industry uh, doing more or less the same thing, were doing the same. So in fact, this article is completely the opposite of what happened to be called out. It's a journalist. She's an environmental journalist so what does she know about trend following uh, and then you have a, an activist that you know there's no 
There's nothing wrong with, with, with being concerned about higher food prices. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying it is wrong to pick out 10 CTAs that probably did the exact opposite of what they're being called out to have done. So that's kind of my little Sunday night, uh, Saturday night rant uh, from out here. <laughs> You're not going to sleep tonight, my friend. I'm not going to so sleep. Look, no. look, yeah, you know, yeah, you know, you know those guys who have a sports team that like always screws it up. I'm a liberal, right? I, I am a social liberal. I am, you know, I, I was on the board of UNICEF for six years. I worked on, you know, trying to find ways to get medical supplies to where they need it faster and better and more efficiently. Like, and and I look at it is. I mean, it is moronic. I mean, it is even, I mean, even coming out of the Biden administration about, you know, blaming oil companies for making money when oil prices go up um, after having constrained the ability of oil companies to actually invest to create sufficient supply. Um, I, I mean, I think, I think, look, I think it's just a problem with the discourse today is that people are starting with the conclusion that they want. And it's, 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 and you and on who start with the assumption that there must be some global conspiracy of pedophiles who are really secretly running the global economy and 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 therefore we're going to find information that we think you know cherry pick information that we can, can can support it or if we can't find it we'll just make it up um and and they'll create this kind of echo chamber it's the same thing that's happening on on the left i mean it's if it, ctas are, are like i mean the idea that they have some sort of created a global food crisis um uh and i'm sure you know i'm sure that these standards we've also created global warming we've created you know the international arms trade we've created i mean if you wanted to focus on guys who profiteer in situations like this it's merchant commodity companies this is what they are built to do. The same guys who have been chased for providing bribes to emerging market countries to get mineral rights and other things. I mean, this is a this is there are plenty of of, of easier villains out there in the context than 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 guys sitting there, you know, pressing enter on on on, on their computer models. But I, I you know I just it's 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 frustrating for me because I think that capitalism and demonization of without capitalism and pay for Greenpeace without people making money to be able to pay for Greenpeace. We've got to find solutions to this stuff without vilifying the sake of having what they think is an easy punching bag. So very, very disappointing because I think there are very serious issues that we have. And it seems like, you know, my team historically, um, I don't recognize them anymore. I mean, they, they, they have, abandoned hard rigorous thoughts there i know people who were hardened liberals battle hardened liberals with meat cleavers for minds who want to come up with solutions that that achieve these outcomes and and they've just been scared away by all of this nonsense so um so I, I don't have anything to add on the on the criticism side other than other than uh uh trying to get worked they, up better they, they do mention mentioned that probably big food quote unquote probably made also a substantial amount of money and i'm sure they did actually make a substantial amount of money probably more by design than than, than what ctas uh, did i think we did it uh, from our shows here in uh, in new york and singapore um with 12 hours difference so one of us sounded very fresh and the other one sounded very tired <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just how it is when you want to get a, a podcast episode out every weekend so uh, i appreciate your time uh andrew uh, i think on this note we're going to wrap up the conversation i hope you enjoyed it and uh, of course you can head over to itunes and leave a rating uh, rating and review so more people can find the podcast next week i'm going to be joined by nick Baltus. he's back nick is of course uh, head of systematic strategies at goldman sachs um so make sure you send in your questions for this episode i'm sure it's going to be incredibly insightful as it always is when nick is on you can email them to info at top traders on plug.com and i'll do my very best to bring them up from andrew and me thanks ever so much for listening we look forward to being back with you next week and in the meantime as usual take care of yourself and take care of each other 
Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.